Good morning and welcome back. Today we'll be talking about the Chicago, Rock Island, and Pacific Railroad's rockets or at least doing a very basic overview of them. And like the last video, doing a brief discussion about some of the lesser known rockets, or at least the ones I couldn't find as much history about. Just go through those and talk a little bit about the Rock Island's early days. And as I believe I mentioned in one of the last videos, I will be eventually making a longer deep dive into why some of the Granger routes failed and why some succeeded. And uh, just do a little bit of discussion and analysis of that and go into if things could have gone differently, what would they have been? But anyways, the Rock Island was one of the many Granger railways that crisscrossed the Midwestern United States, connecting small towns to large cities and helping these smaller towns and um, lesser cities reach their potential by offering competitive rail service. The Rock Island started as an idea in 1845, which was realized by 1853, and was quickly expanding until the Civil War and associated financial strife slowed it down, which would be an ever-present pattern in its history, along with other railroads at the time. Like, this was a very common occurrence, was that railways were starting to expand in the 1850s, and then the Civil War basically just stopped that. And I will bring this up in the video about the UP, but the UP... Uh, which was building the Pacific Railroad, actually, during the two-year height of the Civil War, only built 40 miles of track. The Rock Island is remembered fondly, much like the Milwaukee Road, as being one of the Granger lines that didn't survive till the Mega Merger era. The difference being many of the Rock Island's primary routes actually did survive and are still in use to this day, even if the you know company itself was liquidated at bankruptcy court in uh, 1980. As mentioned, the Rock Island started as an idea in 1845 by a group of businessmen in Rock Island, Illinois, who were endeavoring to connect the city to Chicago. Through hard work and hard sales, the men were able to secure $300,000 in financing after two years of work, and by 1854, the railroad had been fully constructed with the steam engine named the Rocket, pulling the first train out of Chicago. At this time, the railroad was just called the Chicago and Rock Island Railway. The Pacific part was added later towards 1900, after it attempted to build its own connection to California. Expansion was quick. The railroad gained control of a railroad called the Missouri and Mississippi Railroad, which was chartered to run between Davenport and Council Bluffs, Iowa. And also, um, brief historical notes on that is that Omaha hadn't been selected as the starting point for the Pacific Railway. That wouldn't happen until about 1862, which was eight years later. This happened during the Civil War because of the South and the North were arguing over where the Transcontinental Railroad would go. The South seceded, so the North got to make the decision, and they decided um, on Omaha. By securing this company, the Rock Island became the first railroad to bridge the Mississippi and start building for the Missouri River and the quote-unquote West, which was the Western United States. This was the first bout of financial problems it would face in its history. As per usual with railroads, there were financial panics and credit dried up and construction stalled. This meant that the Rock Island felt short of making it to Council Bluffs and slipped into bankruptcy and was reorganized during this period. The company was chartered to complete itself to Council Bluffs, Iowa by June 1, 1869, or it would lose its land grants in Iowa. Following the first reorganization, a man named John Tracy was brought in to run the railroad in 1866. Under his leadership, the railroad reached Omaha, but it was the third railway to do so, despite owning the first company that was chartered to make the first rail line. The CB&Q beat them by about six months, and the Chicago and Northwestern beat them by a little over two years. And this was the beginning of a pattern that the Rock Island would unfortunately face through its pretty much all of its history on all of its routes, that being one of the first to set off somewhere but end up being the last to serve the era that any specific area. Under John Tracy and Hugh Ridley, the Rock Island continued to expand across the Midwest despite not being the first to reach many places. At this point, it was starting to buy up other railroads to reach places, which included reaching Kansas City in 1879 and the Twin Cities in 1885. It was even noted as dominating Iowa so much that it had twice the route mileage in the state that than even the Chicago Northwestern, which was number two. Expansion continued on the Rock Island through the remainder of the 1800s and even had some strong expansion in the early 20th century under the Reed Syndicate, which I couldn't really find too much information on what that was beyond it was a Midwestern business group and or cartel that existed in the late 1800s and early 20th century. This expanded included routes through Kansas, primarily Wichita, and down to the Gulf Coast through what is now Oklahoma. Other expansions included reaching Denver, Colorado Springs, um, which were all reached by 1889. And in 1901, the Choctaw route was started to link to Comcary to Memphis, Tennessee, and it was eventually bought by the Chicago and 
Rock Island and Pacific. They didn't actually build it. They bought the railway that was building it and basically gobbled them up. And at the same time, they completed their branch of the Golden State Route, which linked to the El Paso and Southwestern, which was, as mentioned in the video, when the Golden State Route was absorbed into the SP in 1924. Before we get into the rockets, I will um, have a little disclaimer, and um, which is basically going to be listing off the routes that I will make into their own video at some point. These being the Rocky Mountain Rocket, the Twin Star Rocket, the Texas Rocket, the Zephyr Rocket, and the Choctaw Rocket. All five of those will get their own videos at some point in the future. As time of writing, only the Rocky Mountain Rocket is actually on the drawing board, but rest assured the rest of them are going to get their own video at some point. These rockets are more significant and frankly have more substance to them and I can get more out of the videos, which is why they're going to get their own videos, even if they might end up being a little shorter. In this, bell, in this video, I will be talking a little bit about the Corn Belt Des Moines Rocket, the Peoria Rocket, the Rock Island Rocket, and possibly some of the other secondary passenger trains. Like he, um, if they come up, the Rock Island was the rockets ran the Rock Island first in 1937, and they were kind of a sort of in between phase between the Zephyr and the City train sets and the Super Chief style train that would start running around the same time. The first rockets, like the Burlington Zephyr, started out as being relatively short regional trains rather than the long distance flagships that a railroad would be proud of, and. I would argue that the Golden State Limited and later and or later Rocky Mountain Rocket would qualify more as the Rock Island's flagship train, but given its secondary status among the Midwestern railroads and its constant financial trouble after the Depression, arguably the Rock Island didn't really have a full-on flagship train like most other railways did. The first rocket train set consisted of three or full, four fully articulated train sets, an EMD TA locomotive, and a detachable observation lounge car. A little side note on the EMD TA. It was a somewhat unique piece of equipment. The ones the Rock Island ran were the only ones of their type and were a predecessor to the more well-known EMD E and F series of engines that were built mostly after World War II. So a quick rundown on the EMD diesels is that the letter said for how much horsepower the unit generated. So the F units were 1,400 horsepower, the E units were 1,800 horsepower, which meant the T units were 1,200 horsepower. So clear as mud, hopefully, <laughs> which is probably why they changed their modeling um, number system after World War II in the 50s. So they went to the current, just like they're, the, each model is just given a number and the number determines stuff <laughs> about the engine. Anyways, back to the train sets themselves. Generally, the train sets would consist of the following types of cars, which also kind of brings me to the question, do we call the segments in multiple units cars? I'm kind of not sure, but anyways, the rockets would have a combine coach baggage dinette, a full coach or two, and then a parlor car, and then a um, on the end they'd have a lounge car with a drawing room and buffet lounge and that kind of thing. And a buffet lounge, from what I can gather, um, is more like the Amtrak, pre-Amtrak version of a cafe car. Um, some people who have written about these cars com would compare these trains more to long distance commuter trains rather than full like daylight style trains. So in a sense, these trains are actually, these rockets rather, are more similar to modern state support and Amtrak trains. And in a way, are kind of where the spiritual pet predecessor of the you know, Am today's like Midwestern Amtrak trains, so the Rock Islands rockets kind of live on with spiritual successors, even if they don't really have any direct successors, but that's just kind of a little note that I want to make on myself. As mentioned, these trains started out only running short regional routes. The first six rockets were as follow, the Peoria rocket between Chicago and Peoria, the Des Moines rocket between Chicago and Des Moines, the Texas rocket between Fort Worth and Houston, the Denver rocket between Kansas City and Denver, the rocket between Kansas City and Oklahoma City, and finally the Kansas City rocket between Kansas City and Minneapolis. The Denver rocket only lasted a little over a year before it was canceled and replaced by the rocket running a different route entirely. So the, the train that was just the rocket was the successor to the Denver rocket because reasons and probably low ridership. As you can see, these are all fairly short routes that would fit in Amtrak's current system very well um, with a, you know, what Amtrak would run today would be a baggage car and a couple of Horizon coaches and a cafe car and maybe a business class car. As mentioned before, the Texas rocket will be sort of kind of included in its own video because they did share tracks with the CB&Q via a subsidiary in Texas and that will be its own video discussion someday, not sure when. So as time went on, all the rockets faced a steep decline in ridership, much like every other railroad in the country. In 1966, most of the Rock Island's famous trains were still running, which included 
all the rockets mentioned above, excluding the Kansas City, Oklahoma City train, they were still, there was still service between Kansas City and Fort Worth, though, but it, this also avoided a direct connection with Oklahoma City because of the structure of the Rock Islands network. And I'm betting the line got canceled because there's probably just couldn't compete with the Santa Fe, Chicago, and Kansas City, and whatever, and trains, or the Texas Chief, just like the CB&Q kind of dropped its Kansas City, Chicago service for the same reason. I'm willing to bet the Rock Island did as well. Three years later, the Rock Island had basically dropped all of its passenger trains, including the Peoria rocket, which was reduced from two round trips to one, and a bus, or it was, yes, and the Des Moines slash Corn Belt rockets, which were truncated to a once a day round trip between Chicago and Rock Island. So the Rock Island, basically in the course of like three years, dropped all of its passenger service. And this is where the painful end of the Rock Island rockets starts. When Amtrak was chartered in 1970, the Rock Island was assessed that it would have a $4 million buy-in fee to join Amtrak and be relieved of its obligations to provide passenger trains. And this was greater than the cost the Rock Island estimated it would incur to keep the trains running until 1975, when it could just end the trains through the ICC, or at this point the, uh, the Illinois version of the ICC, and it wouldn't have to pay Amtrak anything, which ended up being a mistake, frankly. This was the start of a long saga the Rock Island would have to deal with <laughs> as it was coming apart at the seams. At first, the state of I well, Iowa, Illinois, was willing to help the Rock Island with its losses on its two remaining pasture trains, which um, ran only in Illinois. And this agreement stipulated that the state would pay two-thirds of the losses in order to keep the trains running, and the operating subsidy topped out at a million dollars per year from the state, so basically they would, in theory, have their losses covered until they could cancel the trains. But the losses the railroad faced increased far faster than that, and since the Rock Island was deferring maintenance to cook the boats to look better for a merger with the Union Pacific, which the UP declined in 1972, the trains were taking longer and longer and longer to complete the journeys, which turned away traffic at an unprecedented rate. By 1978, when the trains finally stopped running, the entire passenger division was averaging 17 riders per day. And this is after them running the trains until 1975, which they were obligated to do, and then three more years as IDOT and Amtrak attempted to maintain service along the routes, but ultimately failed. So the saga with Amtrak is fairly interesting, to say the least. Amtrak rejected taking over the two remaining rockets and running them over their existing routes when Illinois kind of petitioned for them to become Amtrak routes. They refused because the state of the trackage between Chicago and its two endpoints were just in such terrible condition, and the costs that they would have to incur to make sure the trains could would run um, into Union Station where all of other Amtrak's other trains were and still are terminating could terminate. And over a few years, they eventually hatched a plan that would see Amtrak taking over the Quad Cities rocket, as it was called at that point, and rerouted over the Chicago and Northwestern between Chicago and Agnew, and then over Burlington Northern into Rock Island. A similar plan was hatched with respect to the Peoria rocket as well. It would run over the Santa Fe tracks at Chilkoff, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, and then run over the Rock Island into um, Peoria proper. And this... <laughs> became off the rails, pun intended, because IDOT didn't want to push the Santa Fe or the CNW too hard, and the Chicago Northwestern also just was blatantly not interested in hosting any passenger train under any circumstance, and this happened over the course of 1975, and as this, this just continued to drag out, in 1976, dining car service was suspended on the Rock Island remaining trains due to low patronage, and the only reason they lasted this long was that the union for the dining car staff managed to get a very expensive severance package out of the railroad back when the railroad was doing better should they discontinue dining car service, and it took until 1976 for the severance package to be cheaper than continued operation. And also because of this package in 1972, the Rock Island took a sideline dining car which and club car because they were um, had maintenance issues and the Rock Island just didn't want to pay for them, and I believe they were from the Golden State, which had been canceled by then, and they parked... Um, these two cars on track one at LaSalle Street Station to run a restaurant just to avoid paying a severance package to the dining car crew. At this point, the Rock Island was getting very anxious to discontinue its pasture trains, so it petitioned the Illinois Commerce Commission, which was, the, as I mentioned, the Illinois version of the ICC, to allow them to discontinue the trains, which they denied on a 3-1 vote after dragging their feet, for, feet collectively for a few months. They wanted to give IDOT time for its plans to work, which the one descending commissioner said was wishful thinking. So to do, to avoid 
the continued bleeding, they took their case to the federal ICC, who after deciding yes, then no, then yes again, and staying their decision a couple times, finally allowed the Rock Island to cancel its last two passenger trains. And on December 31st, 1978, the Peoria and Quad Cities rockets left LaSalle Street Station for the last time and then trundled off into the history books. So this brings us to where we are today with these trains and um, what has happened and transpired. So since being discontinued, the state of Illinois has attempted to revive the train several times. At first, the Peoria rocket was indirectly revived for about a year and was named the Prairie Marksman. It ran down the old GM and O line from Chicago and then turned into onto a short line and ran to East Peoria. And this train didn't even hit half of its ridership projections needed to justify continuing the route. And as of 2009, it seems that IDOT has largely given up on this route and is just living with the bus connection to to and from Peoria to the existing, I believe it's the, um, the trains to and from St. Louis. The Quad Cities Rocket, on the other hand, is seemingly doing far better. Illinois passed funding to revive the line in, 2000, in 2019. It has secured some federal funding to help with the line, and IDOT has come to an agreement to run, I believe, two round trips per day as far as Moline, which is just outside of Rock Island via the BNSF mainline, to Wayanet, and then over the Iowa Interstate, which what is the old Rock Island line, as far as Moline. And for, as I had, yeah, the Iowa Interstate is the railway that bought the um, Chicago-Omaha portion of the Rock Island when it went under. So, and I also believe the Quad Cities rocket revival is on Amtrak's 2035 map, which, um, yeah, that's a video discussion that I mean I am going to make, but I don't think at the time, at the time of recording, I haven't made that yet. It's probably going to get made in the next couple days because that's going to be a far faster video and hopefully it's out by the time I'm rambling about it. So anyways, that was the sh long and short of the Rock Island and its rockets and its less um, illustrious rockets and as mentioned at least three of them maybe four will get their own videos someday and um, the Rocky Mountain Rockets the only one that's on the drawing board as of late so hopefully you did enjoy and you found this informational and uh, do the YouTube things of liking sharing subscribing I do release videos roughly every other week and occasionally we'll be releasing some shorter ones um, whenever they come out and as mentioned I will be doing a much deeper dive into the Granger routes, including the Rock Island and what they, ha why they failed, why some succeeded, and what could have gone differently to keep them alive. So hopefully that will come out at some point over. I think I'm shooting to have it out in October. I'm still not done writing it or doing the notes and the research because I'm recording these in May. <laughs> so yeah, hopefully, hopefully that'll come out. Anyways, I will see you in the next one.